sorry about the TBR. It does have a title. <laughs> I just failed to enter it into the wiki. I'm really sorry. <laughs> oh, it, it's... Okay, can we turn the microphone up louder? I mean, it's definitely on. Can you hear me better now? Yay, okay. It was just out of the okay. I'm not used to speaking with a microphone, as you can probably tell. Uh, so yeah, my name is Linda. I just moved to Oslo in January. So um, before that, I lived in London. And I also, like for t 12 and a half years, and I also lived in Stockholm for two years while I attended Hyper Island. Um, I'm an interface developer. I have been, I mean, I studied philosophy and computer science at university, and after graduating from university, I became an interface developer, which mostly means I write JavaScript for a living. Um, and as you all know, JavaScript has take, taken over the world, so it's all good for me. Uh, so, but I have, I have been to Oslo uh, in the past uh, decade, and if any of you have seen any of my work, it it might be this. Not auto playing, okay. So this was a project I did with uh, Bymiljøtaten uh, to uh, put like little Arduinos in the um, garbage bins around Oslo. Uh, it was going for two weeks and uh, they had peer sensors, like infrared sensors in them, so they could detect when somebody threw something in them and they would play a sound outside the cinema, cinema sound. And uh, it was like just a part of trying to get people to be more aware of like trash cans that exist, please use them. <laughs> sort of attitude campaigns that they run from time to time. Thank uh, you for using me. So if you did see, if you were in Oslo <laughs> in 2013, <laughs> maybe you saw them. Um, so yeah. Uh, but what I really wanted to talk to you about is uh, Code Club. And um, let me just like set the, the stage for you. So we're in 2012 in Britain. Uh, Eric Smith of Google had said that Britain was throwing away its digital heritage. And what he meant is Britain, the inventor of the computer, uh, was not teaching computing in any sensible form whatsoever. And he was outraged. Um, and this sort of uh, gave the media something to, you know, feed on. And there was a media frenzy, and everyone was talking about how uh, IT, which it was called, sucked as uh, a subject in school. The IT curriculum had, in its time, been developed together with Microsoft. And what Microsoft felt was really necessary for kids to learn was how to use Excel, <laughs> Word, PowerPoint, you get the drift. So there was absolutely no programming involved, unless you count, like, Excel. And, um, like this had to go. And the government actually eventually got so embarrassed about all of this negative press that they said, okay, IT is out. We're gonna scrap it, no more IT, it's gone. But they didn't like replace it with anything. <laughs> so it was 2012 and nobody was learning anything about computers in school. So uh, that's when, um, me and my friend Claire, so I, I worked at Last FM at the time as an interface developer, and um, me and my friend Claire met up after work one day in the pub, as you do. And we were like, oh my god, this is, you know, the media is talking about this, we need to do something, what if we like arrange a hack day? And we got really excited and we had a little drink and we were like, 
yeah, let's make this awesome hack day for kids and we can introduce them to how amazing programming is and we'll get everyone excited. And uh, we had a lot to drink. <laughs> uh, so the more we talked about this, the more we were like, but like one hack day, like one hack weekend, that's it, that's not enough. Like we need like all children to learn how to program and it needs to be like every week and it can't just be like a one-off thing. So I don't know if you do this, but certainly for me at the time, I would often go to the pub, talk about something and somehow buy a domain, like buy a domain name. <laughs> I'm sure this has happened to you as well. Uh, so we had a lot of beer. It's cheap in London. Uh, and I bought a domain name. We even like made a website. It didn't really say anything, the website. It was just like, put your email here if you're interested. That was it. I mean, but we had a plan. Like we were gonna teach everyone to code, like all children in the UK. And um, then this happened, you know, like we had a mission and I made a tweet and this tweet was not viral by any means, as you can see. And then somehow, somehow, like Wired, BBC Tech, not the top thing on BBC Tech, but the second thing on BBC Tech, coding lessons for everyone <laughs> coming soon. And you know, like, okay, we had a website and we had some emails and that was it. <laughs> so the whole thing was complete vaporware and it wasn't wired on BBC News. And, and then we were like, well now, now we have to do it. <laughs> we can't just like, uh, sorry guys, got drunk. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, so, uh, what we did was we gathered some of our friends. Uh, Mozilla lent us uh, their meeting room and, and we started talking like, what can we do? What is out there? If you're gonna teach all children how to program, how should we even start? And I'm a little bit sad that we're not in the logo room right now. Like there's a logo room <laughs> and you know, that, that yeah, you should all read Simon Peppert. Um, but anyways, we, uh, so we got together. We, we knew uh, a little bit about the work of, or I knew a little bit about the work of uh, Simon Peppert and uh, Logo and the turtle and like previous attempts at teaching children how to code. And uh, what we found out is that they have actually developed a programming language called Scratch. And we made games using Scratch. Um, and we made like these projects. Uh, it was like 20 of them to begin with. <clears throat> uh, just like a group of people in an afternoon writing some games and then writing down the instructions to how to write those games. And, and that was it. And if you don't know Scratch, uh, it's basically a programming language and environment uh, uh, where you don't have to type any words, you just use the little uh, puzzle uh, Lego bits and put them together, which is really good for kids because, you know, like spelling doesn't matter. You don't ha actually have to type anything at all. Um, so uh, it's really great for teaching kids uh, programming. And it also exists in a lot of languages, um, like human languages. Um, so we did that. And then uh, I tested them on my friend Claire as a, as a first step. Um, so Claire's not a programmer. She was uh, working in um, like user experience design um, and advertising. And so we got Claire a bit hyped up on candy and like put her in front of the computer. And so, okay, you, you get to test these uh, 
first, and then uh, when we knew that uh, she could do them, uh, we started testing them in schools. So we had uh, 25 pilot schools in London that we worked with to begin with. And uh, I would also like go around to the schools and like find out what are these kids actually interested in. <laughs> Do some like user research. Um, and uh, we'd also like test um, uh, all of the lessons that we made and uh, get the kids to answer right, like a very short questionnaire about how they thought the lesson was. And uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, people thought that Code Club was 92% fun. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. <laughs> like, um, and then uh, we went to a, fun, like a, a kind of conference and made a, a video to uh, spread the word about Code Club, if you will. Your name? My name is Niklas Sjöström. So why would you like to work at Code Club? I have made a few uh, software, done um, something called Skype. I think I have a else? Well, I have a few others, but they were not as big, but... Uh, my name is Joanna Shields. Uh, what do you think you can do for Code Club? I was chief executive of a company called Bebo. Justin Bieber? Um, no, actually a company called Bebo. Mm. Next, as you know, Code Club is an after-school activity aiming to teach children the basics of coding. What do you think you bring to the table? Well, I'm Chad Hurley. I uh, created YouTube. Oh, I know. Did you, did you do that one where the baby bites the other baby's finger? No, I, d I don't make videos. Next. Tessa Jal. Actually, it's Dame Tessa Jal. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, Brent and Martha. Oh, we, 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 we started, started lastminute.com. Next. Yeah. Sit down. What's your name? I'm Tim Berners-Lee. What do you think you bring to the table? I invented the, the World Wide Web. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Next. Um, so this is Prince Andrew, Prince for those who are to be not honest British. With you, Mr. Windsor. So why would you like to work for Code Club? I think it's a, a, a very useful skill, uh, for, particularly for people like yourselves and young people. And I think it opens up huge opportunities in the future. <laughs> and I suppose I know some influential people. Like who? My mother. Um, so yeah, getting famous people to spread the word for you is, is great. Um, but I think like the most genius thing about Clo Code Club is because we didn't have any money whatsoever. We were like, okay, where can we find venues? Where can we find kids? How can we do this without spending anything? And uh, we decided on this genius thing of what if we do it in schools? Schools have space, they have computers, and they have kids. Oh my god. They have like everything we need. Um, so uh, we decided to uh, set up this as an after-school program um, in, in actual schools. Uh, a volunteer who was a uh, programmer of some sort, a professional, would go and um, go to the school. Uh, a teacher would also be there to help with uh, anything. And um, that's basically how it worked. Like any school could sign up for free. All the lessons were available uh, on our website and uh, they were like maintained on GitHub and anyone could improve them. And um, this also meant that it spread like really quickly to other countries, which was great. Like people would just take the lessons and translate them to another language and then they were good to go. Um, so it was really, really good. <coughs> and we also got a lot of amazing uh, feedback from the teachers. And this is the only thing you're going to have to read, I promise. Uh, well, maybe some tweets, actually. But those doesn't count. So yeah, they have learned to test and to work to solve problems and not just accept that there is only one way to achieve something. Like, kids should know that. 
uh, there has been a marked difference in the way Code Club members approach problem solving, a more analytical approach and a way of seeing mistakes or errors as part of the process of learning. Like, I don't know what they were teaching kids before, but if they didn't like know this, I, you know, this is pretty essential. Of course you should know that. Um, and like teachers were reporting that they were more willing to help each other and to find solutions and they were no longer just like raising their hand to ask what is the answer. They were actually trying to explore uh, on their own and um, yeah, it's uh, and, and everyone loved it. Like everyone loved you seeing uh, uh, our lessons pretty much teachers and children's and volunteers, so it's pretty good. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, it was all on GitHub, and um, so it spread like wildfire. And one of my favorite parts was seeing what all the kids made. This is one of my favorite things ever, a website made by a Code Club member, and it's about chinchillas. And, uh, as a weird side note, like when I wrote the the web curriculum, um, I wrote thank you on on the at the end of the exercise, and then all of a sudden all these websites kept popping up, and they all said thank you at the bottom, <laughs> as if it was supposed to be there in the website. <laughs> and I really like it. It's like it's cute. <laughs> it's like thank you for reading my website. Um, but of course, uh, we had problems as well. Uh, Code Club was massively oversubscribed. We couldn't teach everyone who wanted to. There weren't enough volunteers. So on our website, schools could um, basically uh, request a volunteer. They'd be like, yes, we really want to do this. We've set it up. It's all ready to go. All we need is a volunteer. And then we just we didn't have enough volunteers, even though we had you know a thousand volunteers. It just wasn't enough for the amount of schools that wanted to do this, which was everyone. Because what were they supposed to do when that, now that they knew that they weren't supposed to teach IT? <laughs> <laughs> like all the teachers were looking for something, um, and um, yeah. <sighs> Uh, hackers, in the proper sense of the word. That's what we want, right? That's what we want our children to be. Um, and uh, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the later problems <laughs> I've got. <laughs> um, so, uh, in order to try to reach more people, like, because code clubs are massively oversubscribed, we, we needed money and we asked for funding. Like, in the beginning, we didn't get any funding whatsoever. Like, I would go to places and ask for a thousand pounds, and they would be like, no, you should, like, go to a government and get, like, a million pounds, but we won't give you a thousand pounds because, well, we think you should have a million. And I'm like, but I just need a thousand. <laughs> and there, it was just, it was really, really hard. Uh, so, our first sponsor sh sponsorship was from Nesta, uh, and uh, it was 250000 and it was, you know, really good. And then, once you got something, then everyone wants in on it, and all of a sudden we had funding from also Samsung and Google and Canary Wharf, um, because Tower Hamlets is like the poorest borough in London, but it has Canary Wharf, it has all of the money. And there's like a little bit of a discrepancy there. Uh, so uh, they needed some positive press. And then of course we had Prince Andrew, uh, which if, if I can just give you like one piece of advice, is like don't work with royals. <laughs> uh, I, I know that Norway is possibly the only country that loves their royals more than Britain. <laughs> but, uh, and, and you can tell yourselves that the Norwegian royals are relatively harmless, at least they don't veto wars like the British ones do. Um, but, uh, you know, it's uh, Prince Andrew is best buddies with somebody who was 
convicted of having sex with minors? And what do you do when you have a best friend that is a convicted pedophile? You need to find some charities involving children to put your face on <laughs> so that you get happy stories. <laughs> um, and I mean, I'm not denying that Prince Andrew did a lot of publicity for us, but the whole thing is a bit, I don't know, it doesn't feel good, you know? And uh, also, I had to spend, so the day that they legalized gay marriage in the UK, I had to spend it with Prince Andrew, and the whole day he was just like, oh, children should have, uh, you know, two role models of different genders, and uh, it liked all of this rants about how terrible it was. And, and you know, you can't say anything, because like, they, they are like above the law, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, let me, so I had some problems <laughs> the sponsorship money, <laughs> let's just say. And um, so I need to uh, uh, set the scene for you again. I mean, I keep telling myself that I'm Generation X because when I was a kid, I had to bike for five kilometers to the nearest library to go on the internet, which they let you sign up for in 15 minute intervals. And I, I mean, I, I mean, I want to, I want to believe that this makes me different from the regular millennials that you read so much negative press about all of the time. But, but then there's this. Maybe I am a millennial. For yeah, I was fired from my own company over a tweet. And now you're all wondering what the tweet is. I'm sure. So, <clears throat> one of the things that I've been talking a lot about is like the dangers of corporate mass surveillance. And I'm like very vocal about this. And so everyone naturally assumes, oh my God, Google got you fired because they don't like you talking about this. But it's actually not true. It's this tweet. I didn't even tweet it. This is my friend Russ. Some of you might know him as the founder of the London Hackspace. And he tweeted this tweet, which, but you can see that I interacted with the tweets and that was, you know, evidence enough. Um, so yeah, Code Club is, support, is supported by Samsung, who actually build weapons, and the UK government, who use them. And I like that tweet. <laughs> um, so, but it was because I was thinking about, like, is there actually a way that I can like not participate in the war machine, or? Are all humans just like, do we just have to accept that we are a part of, of war and profiteering on war? Is that just a thing that we have to accept? And, you know, these are not viral tweets or anything. This is just like me talking to my friends. Actually, me talking to myself, and then my friend replied, and then all hell broke loose. But um, something happened. Britain sells a lot of weapons, they get used, innocent people get killed. And I was just, uh, I just wanted to know if it was even possible to work without any military funding coming to me so that I can feel good about not profiteering from wars and people suffering. And I mean, I, I'm not even sure it is possible. Um, because, I mean, we all pay taxes. <laughs> I mean, that's not money going to me, but that's my money going to something. And, um, and Scratch was made at MIT Media Lab, which is heavily funded by the military. And, uh, like, yeah, the internet. Let's not even go there. <laughs> um, so maybe it's not possible. But in any case, my friend Russ tweeted this. I liked the tweet, and I immediately got a call from the trustees of Code Club saying, you're not allowed to say that. I didn't actually say it, but okay. Um, I, d I did like the tweet, I admit to that. Um, and um, let me just set the scene for you. So this is uh, August uh, 2014. Great news had just happened. The Britain 
was going to make computing compulsory for everyone starting September. Like, this is what I've been working towards my entire time at Code Club. Like, uh, because Code Club just wasn't enough, because we were oversubscribed, not all the kids in the school got into the Code Club, not all the schools had Code Club, it was obvious from the beginning that this is something that needs to be compulsory in all schools, so that it's like all children, not just the geekiest children, who get introduced to computers. So, uh, I was very happy about that, and then I thought, amazing, now that, you know, uh, the school is taking care of all of the curricula stuff. Code Club can be an amazing thing that, like, we can go further, we can only do things for fun, and, like, they can decide their own projects, and we don't have to worry about getting the basics in, because they're going to learn a lot in school, and then we can do, like, more awesome stuff with them in the Code Clubs. Uh, and I was actually at MIT at the time, um, working on uh, finishing an Arduino curriculum. So we were teaching Scratch and Python and web already, and I was working on the, a new Arduino thing, like getting into hardware. And, and uh, I was working with Google as well, <laughs> which made it even, even like weirder when I, I got this um, email from um, the board of directors basically saying like, uh, if you are to continue working at Code Club, you're not allowed to say anything uh, mean about any of our sponsors, which includes like not talking about <coughs> Samsung as a weapons manufacturer, not talking about uh, Google and uh, corporate mass surveillance, and not uh, talking any saying anything negative about royals. Not even Prince Andrew, like just royals. Like I'm a Republican. And it just, I, I really wish I had the email, but unfortunately, like, right after uh, this uh, decision, they just uh, blocked me from my email. So, uh, yeah, back up your email. <laughs> Otherwise, I would show it to you, because it was kind of hilarious, because it also say, and take down this tweet. And like, yeah, I can do some tech, but I cannot take down someone else's tweet. Like, I can't, like... <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> like, what are you expecting from me? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that. Code Club for me was over, which I was very sad about because obviously it was, uh, you know, my baby. Um, I've been there from the start, it's what I've been working on it for two years, and even though, yes, we just got this uh, major breakthrough, like the UK is gonna teach computing to everyone in primary school, I was still looking forward to like taking Code Club to like more interesting, cool things and like, yeah. But whatever, you know, uh, Code Club continues without me. Uh, so immediately after I was fired, it was acquired by Raspberry Pi. You might have heard of Raspberry Pi. Um, and um, they now do it as part of their outreach, and also the government gave them lots of millions of pounds to distribute Raspberry Pis in all schools. Which is good, right? It's good. Um, so there's over 6,000 code clubs in the UK now. Uh, there's 75 projects, they're all on the website and on the Raspberry Pi GitHub. Uh, so you can all steal them. I encourage you to. Uh, I mean, one of the good things I did in the beginning was to make all of the lessons Creative Commons. Um, and they did, they did try to put them behind a paywall at some point, and I was like, it's Creative Commons, okay, I'll just put them up on another server, and they were like, okay, okay, we'll, we'll keep them open. Um, and, um, and yeah, teaching 84,000 children how to program every week in weekly, weekly after-school clubs, mostly run by volunteers. And as you can see, there are also 12 official code clubs in the rest of the world. There's a lot of unofficial ones, because uh, like one of the first ones to uh, start was Code Club Argentina. Uh, I went there to speak at uh, RubyConf, and then, like, you know, 30 minutes later, somebody has already started Code Club Argentina. And uh, Norway was also one of the first ones, Kudeklubben, that's also an unofficial one. 
And it's because uh, Code Club now has a new funding model, which means all the Code Clubs in the rest of the world pay Code Club UK uh, for access to all of their stuff. And it's just like, I can't even, I, just the idea of like ex-colonies <laughs> paying the UK to teach how to, pro like I just can't even go there. But at least the materials are still available, except for the Adrena one, which mysteriously disappeared. Uh, but there's lots of Raspberry Pi ones instead. So, you know, you can buy a Raspberry Pi <laughs> and use those. Um, and yeah, those are on the website. And if you're looking for something um, to use, start with that. So <clears throat> after this debacle, I was wondering what to do when Nesta contacted me about the scout situation. So uh, in the UK, there are 600,000 kids uh, doing scouts. And they get badges for doing stuff. And they wanted some tech things to teach them how to do more techy stuff. And they had kind of made a curriculum which wasn't really inspiring. <laughs> Turn on and log into a computer. <laughs> yeah, so much fun. Give this to a kid and watch them run away. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that's why Nesta contacted me and was like, okay, we're doing digital uh, skills badges, um, digital citizen uh, badges. We're doing two badges, each with five stages. That's like 10 actual badges you can get on your scout uniform, all to do with tech. And uh, I just made them activities that they could do. So one of my favorite ones is kite mapping. So uh, you take your camera and you put it on a kite and you go fly it around and then you take it back and you get all of the pictures of it. Like you have to, so we do this the cheapest way possible. So you have like a very, very old camera that someone has laying around and you tape a little rock to the shutter button so that it keeps taking pictures. And uh, you fly the kite up and you take a bunch of pictures and then you put them on your computer and you can use like different software to stitch it together. And then you can like uh, import it into OpenStreetMap and like uh, drop uh, like uh, roads and buildings in your neighborhood and whatnot. And um, this is a really fun activity that the kids love doing, but it has all of that turning on and off a computer. <laughs> connecting a device to a computer without them really knowing that that's what they're doing, right? <laughs> like, because they're doing a fun thing. They're, they're, they have a task, they're mapping, they're, and flying a kite, and building a kite, and it's all good. And they're also doing all the stuff um, that, that they were required to from their scouting curriculum. Um, so that's, that's good, it's great. It's available to 600,000 kids. Uh, who aren't necessarily very interested in tech, but they're doing scouts and they like the outdoors and they think, ooh, flying a kite is fun, and then we get them hooked, right? Yeah. Um, and then, but you know, I needed a real job and I needed a real job where I was allowed to be a Republican <laughs> uh, <laughs> and talk about corporate mass surveillance and also sometimes question like military profiteering. Uh, so I joined the Guardian <laughs> newspaper. You can say whatever you want when you work for a newspaper, right? Uh, special protections and all that. So um, soon after I joined the Guardian, I started teaching journalists how to program. <laughs> uh, and my, my main two things was uh, sense of journalism, like, what do you do if you don't have data or when you don't trust the data? Like if you're doing something on like the pollution in China, do you trust the Chinese government to like provide you with correct data or do you just want to do your own data? And um, news games, like that's my way to save journalism, news games, you heard it here, it's, it's gonna happen. Um, and also of course, just like Excel. <laughs> Scraping, scraping a website, like, so, so many of the journalists that I worked with were like doing the same sort of manual tasks over and over and over, and they were like, 
going to a website and then go opening a bunch of links and then copy pasting all of the information and they were doing this on a regular basis for like whatever area they were uh, covering for the newspaper and uh, so just like oh but you know you can you can get a computer to do this for you <laughs> and then just look at the data later <laughs> when you need it uh, you can get it to do it on regular intervals even and um, just like saving times like that also just like using a terminal which is terrifying to a lot of people but once they realized that oh my god you know that huge um, file that uh, Snowden gave us, you can actually search <laughs> for the things that you want. <laughs> you know, like basic things like that. And then, uh, in case you don't know what uh, New Schemes is, I just thought I'd tell you. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, New Schemes, uh, one of my favorite examples is Fortress Europe, which is just like a choose your own adventure texting. You just, <coughs> you are a refugee. Uh, that's your situation and you get presented with choices and you click the link of the choice that you take and it takes you to a new page. And uh, like spoiler alert, most of the time you end up drowning in the Mediterranean. Um, but I, I really like that one. Another one that I really loved was uh, Cutthroat Capitalism from Wired where you are a pirate and you're gonna attack some ships and hopefully get some uh, ransom and uh, then you take it back to your tribe and hopefully you'll get rich. And uh, when I started playing this, I was like, okay, uh, where is the Mersk ship? Like, I'm gonna get the biggest ship, uh, ask for two million dollars, and actually that strategy just does not work. Like, it takes a lot of time. Uh, negotiating takes a lot of time. You have to like handle your hostages and stuff. And after playing this for a while, I learned that um, actually if you just attack the nearest one and just ask for $5,000, they will give it to you immediately and then you can attack another one and then you get another $5,000 and then you attack another one. <laughs> and like that way you can make a lot more money, a lot more quicker. So uh, this, this game actually taught me something about why there is a rise in piracy outside of Somalia without me having to just read it and accept it as fact. And, and you know, that's what I, I love about news games. Uh, also, just like finance news games, <laughs> they're so much fun. And um, the thing about news games is that n not everyone reads the news anymore, unfortunately, but everyone plays games. <laughs> like everyone, this is uh, Hillary Clinton playing Candy Crush <laughs> on her plane. Um, so yeah, everyone, absolutely everyone plays games and in order to tell people news in the future, maybe we have to make games. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Uh, oh my God, gamification is a whole other talk. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so I was working at The Guardian and they sent me to a conference like immediately after starting. Um, it's called NICAR and it's about using computers as a tool in journalism. Um, and I was in a talk and then some dude asked this question. Uh, so they were talking about censored journalism as a new thing, even though journalists have been doing censored journalism like forever, I mean the weather. Like, <laughs> that's a thing that, that news do. Um, but uh, anyway, so this guy is standing up asking the speakers, who's the guy? And it's probably a guy who can build the Arduino sensor that I want. And like, that's just like, nope, 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 nope. This is just so wrong on so many levels. Now I need to write a sensor <coughs> workshop thing for journalists. So I did at the next NICAR. <laughs> I was teaching a uh, sense of journalism, like hands-on workshop. Cause like that's, that's, yeah, I guess that's the only way to deal with those people. You need to show them that, hey, actually women can do this stuff too. Um, and journalists can do this stuff. Like you don't need to hire somebody necessarily. Why don't you just try it? Um, so that was fun.
Um, but uh, then this happened. And um, like I had applied for citizenship in the UK twice. Like I lived there 12 and a half years. I applied twice, was rejected twice. I mean, I passed the pub quiz that they give you, like which king was related to which queen and who beheaded whom and like all of those questions can answer them. I'm a good pub quiz buddy now if you need one for your pub quiz. And, um, but, but I still didn't get a citizenship and I was really upset about not being able to vote because, you know, the 2015 election didn't exactly go the way I hoped. <laughs> and um, also the, the Brexit thing, I wasn't allowed to vote and, and it didn't go my way. And then I thought, well, if I, I've already been denied twice. There is no way that I'm going to be allowed, you know, I get a citizenship now after Brexit or so I had to move to, to Norway and now I work in coffee which is also a long story but basically very quickly um, if you've been abroad long enough Norway doesn't let you into the country again unless you have a job of over one year so I have a Norwegian passport and it has a personal ID number thing, but when I came to Norway, they were like, oh, that's been disabled. Like, your personal number doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and I, like, I tried to go and buy uh, a cell phone uh, SIM card, and they need the personal ID, and I gave it to them, and they were like, no, that one's not valid. And I'm like, well, here is my passport with this ID. Look at it. And they're like, no, sorry, the computer says no. Uh, so... Um, <coughs> I needed a job, so I, I applied for some jobs uh, as an interface developer because that's what I do, right? That's what I've been doing since 2007. And um, I, the first interview I went to, I went to two interviews, and at the end they told me, uh, you're really great, but you know, we're looking for somebody who's like more just tech, not like tech and other stuff. And and I went to another interview, and then they told, and I got a second interview, and I thought it went great, but they were like, yeah, you know, we're really just looking for a JavaScript developer. And I'm like, well, I've been a JavaScript developer for 10 years. Like, what? I don't understand. <laughs> uh, no, no, like, but, you know, <laughs> as if I know. <laughs> they, they give you that look, like, we're looking for somebody who does, like, just the tech stuff, not any of that other stuff. And um, I, it just made me think of, of the T-shirt the for this conference, right? Because it has the Venn diagram where it says like tech and society and culture and there's like an overlap and I'm like, I'm like there, I do tech and I also care about where the world is heading and like how we do it. Uh, but they just wanted somebody who was like only the tech thing and not any of the other things. So I just needed a job, and the first available job was in coffee. Now I work in coffee. I was like, fine, I quit tech. I didn't tell anyone I quit tech, but I was like, well, I work in coffee now, so I'm going to stop doing all the other stuff. Except, like, today, in 2017, you can't quit tech, like, because of the world we live in, right? So I come to this coffee company where, by the way, they hired me to do social media marketing and like, you know, uh, PR stuff. And they, they, they buy and sell coffee. I should say we buy and sell coffee. Um, and then they have a list of like 200 coffees. That's a document like uh, with the names and the prices and the area that the coffee came from. And they put that on a website, like the document. And then they're like, email us if you want to buy it. <laughs> and now they're like, oh, you need to market this. <laughs> and I'm like, how can you sell anything if it doesn't have a URL? I don't understand. <laughs> like, none of these coffees have a URL. What's happening? <laughs> so that was the first step. Like, each coffee needs to have a URL, needs to have a page with all of the information, and pictures and a button that says buy this coffee. Uh, basic stuff, basically, yeah. And, um, 
and like all of the things they're doing, right? It's, it's just weird to somebody who has had computers to help them throughout their life because uh, they need to send samples of coffee to people, a lot of samples to a lot of people all over the world. And to mark which coffee is which coffee, they write the name and the area and the little code for that coffee and the price of that coffee and how much we have of that coffee at that time on the label and put it on the label. And we send like, I don't know, like 1,500 samples in uh, a month, all written, like, no, no, no. <laughs> and it's just like, a computer can do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to write labels. Computer can have labels ready for all coffees we have in stock, and it can be updated with, like, how much we have in stock and the price, like, from a database. Uh, so, you know, like, I thought I quit tech, but really I didn't quit tech. I just, I just brought tech to this one coffee company. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's me. And um, I just wanted to say, like, the work isn't over, though, because um, if you're from one of these not orange countries, which you may be, like Sweden and Norway. I know Norway is not technically in the EU, so they're not colored in because of that, but also we don't teach computing compulsory. Uh, so it, it, but just pretend that it's like, I mean, we don't. So if you're from Sweden or, uh, or Norway, you should be worried. If you're from Denmark, at least you are teaching children to uh, program in secondary school, but it's too late. Like, you need to start in primary school. Um, so there's like a, the main organization that is uh, working to get programming uh, on everyone's agenda is called code.org. And if code.org is like the main advocacy group, I'm a little bit worried because these are not the reasons you want to learn to code. <laughs> I mean, uh, Will I am has a that that's a good reason I admit. But all the other people, it's like to be rich. No, fuck no. Like we want to change the world, right? That's what we want. And to be completely honest with you, uh, the reason that they put um, uh, the put this on the agenda in the in the UK to begin with is because Ian Livingston said. We're going to lose two billion if we don't get more people to code, because we would have to hire people from abroad. Oh no, not foreigners! <laughs> like, you know that that is that is the worst thing that could happen, right? In the UK, <laughs> having to hire foreigners. So that's why they want to teach children to code now. So that's what happened. The education in this country is a disaster. We're supposed to be preparing children for a working life. Three quarters of the time, they're bored stiff. Well, I should have thought that being bored stiff for three quarters of the time was an excellent preparation for working life. <laughs> so that's kind of the view. And I just want to say that, you know, it's so much fun. We do so much, like, we can do so many interesting kids, uh, interesting stuff for kids that um, won't bore them. And yeah, okay, maybe it's not to prepare them to be like working at Google. But if we don't if we don't do it, like who's gonna set the curriculum? Like, I have three examples. It will take two more minutes. Um, so, uh, Young Rewired is like a conference for young uh, kids in uh, uh, the UK, and uh, they're being taught how to uh, use drones by BA systems. And yeah, it's cool that we can now teach our children how to use drones, and they can be used for a lot of good. I use them with humanitarian open street map and missing maps to help like Doctors Without Borders. That's great. But if you were going to have somebody teaching your children how to uh, use drones and how to program them, do you want it to be like a military uh, arms company? Because, I mean, they're probably not going to discuss the ethics of like the codes that you're writing, right? And likewise, we now have to teach the teachers um, in the UK to program because they're going to teach the children. 
and uh, there's a lot of money involved in this. And I just signed up for one of the courses just to see what it was all about. And it was like a lot of BT. It was like BT this, BT that. The BT character Tommy Flowers, how British telecoms shaped the country, how BT pioneered fiber optics. And I'm like, this sounds a bit weird. And yeah, lo and behold, this was sponsored by BT. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, like, instead of learning to code, we really need to be talking about uh, coding to learn. Uh, when we learn to read, we also acquire a new way to learn. And after learning to read, you can use your new skill to learn other stuff. And that's how we should be thinking about computing in schools. It's, real, it's not like another subject, like mathematics. It's another skill, like reading. And um, I hope that... Um, I hope that you will get involved, like especially if you have kids, uh, that you will get involved in doing this because um, you can't like leave it to the companies to set the curriculum. I mean, Norway doesn't even have a plan for a curriculum, but you know we need one. <laughs> and um, yeah, like uh, if you leave it to Google, there's not going to be anything about corporate mass surveillance, <laughs> you know. If you leave it to uh, BIA, you won't hear about uh, ethical stuff of using uh, drones. And, um, you know, uh, we, can't, we can't leave it to them. I understand why all corporations want children to learn to code because they need more workers. And it's a lot cheaper to get the government to teach them to code than to invest in like apprenticeships and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's just what I wanted to say. Like, there's, there's work still to be done. Uh, especially in Sweden and Norway, and that's it. Questions? Uh, so, do you want to say something? Uh, are you involved with anything in Norway for, for getting this here? I'm not involved with anything in Norway. I saw it at uh, Lad Kids Are Coding, were hiring a project manager, and I applied for that job, and I didn't get an interview even, so I guess they're not interested. And <laughs> not that I'm better. Um, uh, I don't really uh, know how to go from here, because like in August, uh, there was well, first of all, there should have been some talk about this during the elections, right? Like putting this on the agenda. Like the whole rest of Europe is doing it, except for Norway. And we like to think of ourselves as the best, right? That's how we sell ourselves to ourselves. And then we're, we're so far behind all the other countries. Like, how is it possible? And Sweden as well, sorry to say. Uh, something needs to be doing, like something needs to be done. We need to get this as like an official policy with money attached to it. It needs to be taught in schools, in primary, like at primary level. Secondary school is too late and you've already like lost the girls. They've already had too much advertising telling them this is for boys. And uh, so we need to start as early as possible just to get everyone involved like absolutely everyone, so that they realize that actually no matter what you're going to be doing in the future, a computer is going to make it a lot easier. Like, if you know how to program it. Yeah. Uh. Boo. Hello. Thank you, by the way, for help starting to help teach my nephew James to program. <laughs> Just, um, yeah. And teaching journalists to program has the important effect there's some hope they might be less wrong about their attempts to report on it, so that's also very important. But the question, you, you said that you used to come home from the pub and buy a new domain name. I wanted to know, did you do that before or after sleeping off all the beer? No, no so the, the domain name for Code Club is actually bought like on my phone at the pub. So, so whilst so you were drunk? Whilst at the pub. Dr drunk yeah, yeah, yeah. registration. Drunk registration, yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. Like, do you not do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. I I just uh, wonder where should we get the teachers uh, to teach those uh, children in school? 
Yeah, so what I really, really need to, ex to exist is like, we, well, we need to bring open source thinking to, and culture to teachers. Because the way that they do it now is like everyone's developing their own lesson plans from like a set agenda given by the government. No, we can't have it like that. We, like, it needs to work in the kind of same way that uh, uh, Code Cloud work, where we, we make lessons and we test them and we put it uh, on certain, it doesn't have to be GitHub, but like, we put them on some platform and then people can take them and if they have any improvements, they can improve them. And um, it, it needs to be like this so that everyone can contribute and to make sure that no one organization is like, taking over the agenda, like what happened with Microsoft and the IT curriculum in the first place. Um, so that, that needs to exist, but like there's, it's difficult to take a whole culture and be like, hey teachers, live like us, we know how to do it. <laughs> um, It uh, remains I would like to say something about uh, <coughs> a project that Nug has been uh, trying to uh, get off, on <coughs> uh, get flying. Uh, in Germany, there is a project called Tech Kids, where they are teaching kids to become free software contributors and uh, learn uh, natural sciences, uh, and basically trying to involve the kids in all aspects of the uh, orga organization and trying to get the older kids, the, uh, the more skilled kids, to teach the less skilled kids. And uh, we have been trying to bring this to, to Norway, but haven't so far been able to find the, uh, the people needed to actually get this flying. But I think if we are going to teach people to use computers, they need to, no to learn how to actually cooperate with computers. <laughs> like free software developers are yeah. doing all the time, yeah. instead of the way they are doing now with well, the Scratch website where you have to send your personal information to the United States to be able to use the site at all. And uh, you're not really learning to, to dig deep into the technology, you're just learning to scratch the surface of it. Uh, so uh, I would just want to uh, tell everyone that wants to uh, help out bring free software curriculum to the, uh, to the Norwegian uh, education, uh, get in touch with me. And, and how do they get in touch with you? Uh, search for my name, Peter Reynoldsen. Search yeah. for Nug, you will find me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the talks. We will have to end it here because okay. we need other presentations. So uh, please give another uh, applause.